Hello everybody and welcome to the very last session, as I understand, of this fantastic event that is the Excel Weekend number 9. Um, my name is Tim Heng, I'm glad to have you here, and I'm going to be talking about how to be an Excel World Champion. Now, uh, if you've been watching these sessions back to back, then you probably would have seen Andrew Gagolinovich's uh, session in the directly ahead of mine, uh, which is on the Microsoft Excel World Championship. And he's, t I believe in his session, he talks a lot about um, what the history of the Excel World Championship is and how to get involved and uh, I guess all, all the really cool things about uh, what a great event it is. Um, how it's really put Excel uh, eSports onto the world scene. And so what I thought I'd do is run a session on how to be an Excel World Champion. Um, now, I feel like I'm reasonably well qualified to talk about this, and I'll explain a little bit about why that, why I think that's the case. Um, as I said, my name's Tim Heng. Uh, I'm the director of a company called Some Product, and I've been an MVP since uh, around December 2017. Now, if that's not enough, I also do a lot of the commentating for the uh, Microsoft Excel World Championship and the Financial Modeling World Cup overall. Um, and so uh, I've been, I was, I think I was one of the first people to actually show up on the ESPN stream uh, back when the very first, uh, before it was called the World Championship, back when it was called the FMWC Open. Um, I think uh, Bill Jellin and I were commentating and we ended up on ESPN 3, which was a fantastic experience. Um, in other, when I'm not commentating on Excel, uh, what I'm doing generally is building financial models, training people on how to use Excel, uh, and being the father of two kids who unfortunately prefer the W over the X in Office. Um, luckily, they're only five and three, so they've got a lot of time to uh, to improve that and change their tune in the future. So, what are we going to cover today? We're going to talk about First of all, what is the Microsoft Excel World Championship? Now, I assume that you've seen Andrew's video, uh, but for those people who haven't seen Andrew's video, I'm going to do a very quick recap as to what it is, some of the history, and why it's a really cool thing. Uh, we'll then talk about some of the different skills that are required. Um, how do you succeed at being at, at competing in these Excel esports events, uh, and how how do you perform under pressure? Uh, how because these events are not just um, you know take your own time and do it at your own pace sort of events. They're high pressure um, environments where you've got a limited amount of time to work through them. So we'll talk about some of the tips uh, around how you can adjust the way that you work in order to uh, succeed under that sort of environment. We'll also talk about how to improve and prepare. What are the sorts of things that you can do to get ready for these sorts of events in the future? So first of all, Microsoft Excel World Championship. Now, this is uh, what we're now calling Excel Esports. Um, it's run by the Financial Modeling World Cup team. Uh, so fmworldcup.com if you want to check out more information on them. Um, that's headed up by Andrew Grigolinovich, who, as I mentioned, uh, ran a session at Excel Weekend as well. Um, initially, it was launched as the FMWC Open in 2021, um, and it was rebranded to be the Microsoft Excel World Championship with uh, Microsoft Blessing in 2022 and 2023. Um, and whatever you want to know about the history of it, um, it's, it's important to know that there is a current reigning champion, and more importantly, there is only one champion, Andrew Ngai. Um, he has actually taken this championship uh, for, for all three uh, sessions that, um, that have been run. So right from the FMWC Open back in 2021, um, and the championships in 2022 and 2023. Um, so he has essentially being completely unbeatable in these uh, in this grand event. Now, the Microsoft Excel World Championship is not the only Excel esports event. Um, FMWC run a number of different events. Uh, they also run their financial modeling uh, World Cup. Um, I think that there's a monthly there's a monthly challenge series that they run. They also run a whole bunch of uh, regular uh, events like all-star events and whatnot. They run qualifiers for the World Championship. Um, 
if I'm not mistaken, they also uh, sort of work with another organization in running a collegiate championship for university students as well. Um, again, more information on that, go check out at, um, Andrew's video uh, from Excel Weekend. But I uh, just wanted to sort of highlight that for people who haven't watched Andrew's video. Uh, it's a really cool uh, experience, I guess, to get involved in, to compete against people around the world. Um, and it's raising the profile of Excel. Um, we've seen, as a result of these Excel eSports events, uh, we've seen Excel feature in newspapers, like in mainstream media. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of magazines that have been writing articles about how <clears throat> ESPN are uh, casting these events. Uh, there are articles about how um, how these individuals are going from being consultants to you know being sort of lauded as uh, esports champions, and so I think the increased profile as a result of what FMWC have done has been really cool. So I'm really glad to be involved uh, on the commentator side. Um, I've said for a long time I I don't want to be a competitor. <clears throat> mostly because it's much easier being a commentator uh, because it's easy to spot when uh, people are people are making mistakes and uh, to sort of see the see the big picture when you're looking at it without the pressure of actually having to try and solve the question and earn points at the time. Um, I also have the privilege of being a question designer as well. Uh, Andrew's invited me to uh, design a couple of questions in the past. Uh, so I come with a reasonably unique set of insights as someone who has uh, commentated on a number of these World Cup Championship events uh, and as uh, having actually designed some of the questions. And so you know, I've got a little bit of insight into you know, how, how we want people to solve these sorts of problems. So. What sort of challenges do we do we give people when they're trying to solve problems? Well, we want people to you know, have a diverse range of skills. And if you want to be a world champion, the simple thing is just be Andrew. Andrew and I. He's been a world champion three times, so if you're him, you're going to win this year. Alternatively, um, you could try and have a good understanding of the different functions that you might need. Um, data retrieval functions, data manipulation functions, and so on. Um, having a good understanding of dynamic arrays. Dynamic arrays are hugely useful when it comes to these sorts of events because dynamic arrays help you save time. Uh, by running a calculation and then not needing to copy it to the right or copy it down, um, it just saves you a lot of time because you can just point to a thing, have it calculate for multiple cells at the same time. Um, and you know, when you have a half hour time limit or a 20 minute time limit, or you're trying to answer bonus questions and score points before the next person, um, any amount of time that you save is a really useful tool. Uh, the last skill that you really need in these sorts of events are data tables. Now, I remember when, um, the MVPs were first started first started getting invited to commentate on these events. Um, Bill Jelen, who I'm sure you all know, um, Bill Jelen was amazed at uh, the, the skill and the speed of all these financial modelers who were competing in these events, uh, and in particular their use of data tables, uh, because he had used data tables for you know some uh, you know it, its basic form, uh, but he'd never actually seen them use the way that financial modelers use data tables. Um, financial modelers use data tables to run scenarios on a regular basis. When you're building uh, forecasting models, when you're calculating valuations, when you're uh, evaluating the feasibility of projects, you generally want to run, uh, run your set of assumptions through the model to get a result, but then you also want to run alternative assumptions through the model and compare and contrast the results. Uh, and data tables are a great way of doing that. That's traditionally been used in the financial modeling industry um, to run scenarios. And what we see in the Financial Modeling World Cup events and in the Microsoft Excel World Championship events, um, it's very easy to run uh, scenarios using data tables where you might have a single solution that will work for one set of inputs and because of the way that the uh, the Excel World Championship questions tend to get asked, where you get asked a question, you have a single uh, a single set of items that you can test it on, and then you have a series of say twenty questions or so to to run your run your functions over. Um, 
it, data tables are a really great way of trying to solve all of those at the same time. You answer it for one, and then you feed all of the other 20 inputs into a data table to get your 20 results. So what we're going to do is take a look at what are the different sorts of functions and what are the different sorts of features we might actually need um, an understanding of when we're, when we're working uh, through these problems. So we're going to take a look at uh, a few different functions that we might be looking at. Um, the first table that I have here are data retrieval functions. I've split these up generally into three main categories, lookup functions, aggregation functions, and reference functions. Now, lookup functions, when people think lookup, they normally think of things like vlookup, hlookup, possibly xlookup if you're, uh, you know, if you're used to using modern Excel. You might be thinking index and match. If you're a little bit more old school, maybe just a conventional lookup might be something that's up your alley. Um, and pretty much nobody uses xmatch, but you know it has its purposes as well. It's also worth noting that tools like sumif um, and sumifs are also useful for uh, lookups. Uh, but in general, I tend to lump them into the aggregation functions because um, those functions, while they can be used to look up single values when there are no repetitions, um, in general, they're used to aggregate data, to look through an array of data and uh, summarize it in some sort of way, add up the values, count the values, and so forth. Whether it's sumif, sumifs, countif, countifs. Now, normally I would include something like some product uh, in the aggregation functions list, uh, but what we're finding with the use of dynamic arrays now, some product tends to be used a lot less frequently. Previously, some product was used to try and uh, unlock array functionality, the ability to uh, perform array calculations uh, using control shift enter and so on. Uh, but these days, dynamic arrays mean that we don't need control shift enter arrays. Um, we can perform some product type calculations simply using um, you know, the addition sum multiplication operators. So, you know, in that sense, we don't really need some products quite as much nowadays. Um, it's a bit of a shame because that's what we named the company for because of how useful it was. But uh, some product isn't quite as useful as uh, the rest of these aggregation functions. In terms of reference functions, we've got offset and indirect. Um, now, a lot of people will generally say, you know, you shouldn't be using offset, you shouldn't be using indirect when you're building uh, Excel spreadsheets and financial models because they're volatile. Um, to that, I kind of, I, I don't agree with that idea. Uh, when you're building models, you want to build a model that gives you the right answer, first and foremost. And if a tool like Offset or Indirect is what you need to get the right answer, then that's a tool that you have to use. Um, you offset, I mean, you weigh up the cost of using those functions with the fact that it makes your model volatile. But certainly in these world, world Championship events, we don't really care about volatility quite as much because these are not particularly large files, firstly, that we're working with. Um, and secondly, they're not long-term files. They're not files that need to be audited and need to be checked in the future. So the relative um, the lack of transparency that comes with using tools like Offset and Indirect aren't so much of an issue. So really what we're looking for is using the right tool for the right job. Now, when we're, when we're talking about different lookup functions, um, a lot of people use VLOOKUP, and we've seen a lot of modelers use VLOOKUP in the context of uh, trying to you know, find an item and pick out its value and have that, have that look up the result accordingly. But th these sorts of sessions are all about speed. We want to try and complete uh, tasks as quickly as we possibly can. And so when we have something like a VLOOKUP, what we tend to find, um, if I just jump to an example over here, what we tend to find is that we need our, our lookup table to be in a very beautiful um, ordered format with a lookup item on the left-hand side uh, and the corresponding things to be looked up on the right-hand side. VLOOKUP requires the lookup to be on the left-hand side. Now, when we, you're presented with a problem, it isn't necessarily always presented in this very nice, neat fashion. And as a result, um, you, know, you might have gaps between uh, the inputs and the outputs that you're trying to retrieve. You might uh, find that they're on different rows. Uh, 
you might find that you actually need to create the the lookup table that um, that you're trying to look up. And so trying to shoehorn all of these factors into a VLOOKUP function wastes time because you need to essentially point to a set of data that might be stored in several different places and pull them together in a way that um, in a way that costs time to, to assemble, right? Um, if this table was presented, I'm just going to sort of present this the other way around. Let's try this again. If this item was on the right hand side, what you would find is that you couldn't use a VLOOKUP. And so you would end up wasting a few seconds or wasting some time trying to recalculate it so that uh, your items would be on the left hand side and the corresponding lookup value would be on the right. So anything we can do to avoid spending time uh, or wasting time on those sorts of actions is, is ideal. So rather than use tools like VLOOKUP and HLOOKUP, often the better tool would be to use something like XLOOKUP instead. So if I'm going back to this example and I'm saying I have a bell over here, I want to find out what is that bell worth in points. Well, I can use the XLOOKUP function, XLOOKUP to find that bell's value uh, in the list and give me the result on the right hand side. And that's a much cleaner way of getting me the answer, which isn't going to break as well in the heat of battle. Uh, one of the things that we find when people use VLOOKUPs, for example, is that they might take that value, look it up in this list, pick out the second column, um, and use an exact match. Fair enough, gives me the exact same answer. I'll do the formula text so we can see the difference. VLOOKUP looks shorter. It looks like an easier function. A lot of people who use VLOOKUP tend to do it very quickly. Um, and so they look at something like XLOOKUP and they say, well, that's longer. There are more parameters, more things that I need to put in place. Um, that's a bad idea, right? The problem is that when you're working in a high pressure environment, you're going to be making changes to the spreadsheets. Um, I can almost guarantee that there will be places where you insert columns, insert rows and so forth, where you might not actually realize that inserting a column in this place will break the VLOOKUP. In this case, it's looking up this table, uh, but instead of finding the base points column, uh, it's finding the second column being that hard-coded reference of the number two in the VLOOKUP, uh, and that second column has is a set of blanks. So this is one of the classic gotchas that people run into when they use VLOOKUP in the real world. Um, and when you're under pressure in a, in a you know, half hour battle environment, what you're going to find is that these sorts of problems are exacerbated. They happen very frequently and you don't have time to rectify them or try and work out why your formula suddenly doesn't work. Um, the last thing you want when you've only got half an hour to complete a whole bunch of questions and when you're in a competition is additional work trying to debug things that are broken because they weren't robust to start off with. So using functions like XLOOKUP, using functions like INDEX and MATCH to find these values, that generally tends to be a, I guess, a smarter way of working. Mm -hmm. um, there's another way that you can use lookups as well. Um, if you know that there is a certain order that things always appear in, then what you can do is use a tool like INDEX to give you uh, that result instead. So if you know that these diamonds and the sevens and the, and the clovers and so forth are always going to be items one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and you always want to present them in that order, then what I could do is have values of one to eight somewhere else, uh, being the order that I want to keep looking up these values in. And then instead of using an X lookup or an index and match, I can then use a simple index function. Um, index will allow me to point to an area and then refer to the actual index on the left hand side. You know, I'm looking up the first value, I'm looking up the eighth value. And in that sense, that will just lead me straight to the answer and I don't need to waste time trying to cross match what the particular item that I'm looking for is. Now, this works really well when there are ordered lists. Uh, so if you can set up your approach so that there is an ordered list, uh, this is a nice way of handling it. Now, I mentioned uh, the use of dynamic arrays um, would be really useful. 
So if I look at this index, this index I would put in place, I'd get it to work, and then I would need to copy this down the page. And so there's a number of ways I could do this. Um, people, I see people clicking and dragging, I see people copying and then selecting the range and pasting, I see people uh, you know, finding similar uh, cells nearby and then selecting the range and using keyboard shortcuts like Control D to fill them down instead. Either way, there is work to be done to uh, populate this through multiple cells. Um, if you're using dynamic arrays, a much simpler approach might be to say, um, look at the cells G14 to G21 and just give me that result instead. Um, and this will then present the index function with all of those different items from G14 to G21, and plug them into the index function and show you the corresponding results in each of those cells. Now this is a much faster way to do calculations because uh, instead of having to put the formula in and then copy and paste it, and then if I need to change the formula, I need to copy and paste it down again. And if I modify it in the future, I need to copy and paste it down again. There's a lot of rework that often happens when you're, when you're trying to problem solve. So you have a solution and then you realize it doesn't work all the time. So you tweak the solution and then you realize that doesn't work all the time. So you tweak the solution a little bit more. The more times that you need to tweak and then copy paste, tweak, copy paste, tweak, copy paste, um, that takes time. And if you're using dynamic arrays instead, when I tweak the formula, it will just automatically spill through all the cells that I'm looking for. Now I had to manually select G14 to G21 over here. Um, if I instead had cells where I said, uh, give me a sequence, of eight values. Then instead of saying G14 to G21, I could just say, go to that cell, use the hash uh, operator or the pound operator, depending on where you are in the world. Um, G14 hash will just point to all the cells that the G14 formula spilled to. So because uh, G14 spilled to eight cells, G14 hash will have eight cells. Therefore, my index result will have eight cells. Um, and again, dynamic arrays do this thing where I've, I've solved the problem um, for the first item, I've had it spill over all of the items that I'm looking for, and then um, I can just rinse, rinse and repeat. Whenever there's a minor change that needs to be made, it just gets spilled automatically. Dynamic arrays are really cool and save you a lot of time when it comes to uh, working in this sort of environment. So those are some of the considerations when we're looking at lookup functions. Um, for tools like SUMIF and SUMIFs, COUNTIF and COUNTIFs, uh, I guess really the key thing here is just remembering that they exist um, and what some of the limitations are of them as well. Um, a lot of people when they're using SUMIF and SUMIFs, um, they will have to sort of pause and stop and get confused as to, you know, does the sum range come first or does the, uh, the lookup range come first? Uh, what order do they need to be in? If you know that some ifs exist, then you don't need to set up all of your fancy sum product functions to do multiple criteria um, adding up. You know, there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can use, uh, the, you, you can use these aggregation functions. Um, and I think they're just sort of, having a solid basis for how you use them is a, you know, a really good way of working. Now, these reference functions. These are interesting ones because, again, most people don't use offset and indirect on a day-to-day -day basis. But indirect is a great tool when you're referring to things that are off-sheet, uh, where you might name a particular range or a table or a cell reference uh, and try and find what that uh, particular cell reference is. Um, this might be good if they give you a map. Um, not all of the Excel uh, championship problems are things to do with lookups and, and values and so forth. Often what they do, they give you really esoteric things. Um, they say, here's a map of a city and try and find the corresponding you know, cell references. Um, we had a chess example where um, there are you know, specific target cells, you know, knight is in b7 and that moves to uh, c5 and so on. So you know, being able to use tools like indirect to, to point to specific cells is a great way of being able to sort of you know refer to different cells um, you know, quite quickly. 
The offset function is another tool that you can use for this. Um, if you know that you need to point to a cell and then move it, uh, say in the case of a knight's move in chess, you know, one column across and two rows down, then you can use the offset function to do that. Uh, so if I'm starting off in cell B7, for example, um, B7 I know is the... Um, Actually, let me let me just pull open a new worksheet here. Uh, I've got you know these different uh, uh, points on a board. Uh, so let's go equal sequence, uh, eight rows and eight columns. There you go. I've populated sixty four points on a chessboard. Now, if I'm starting off in B seven, so I could say equals B seven. Um, that's a fifty. I'm going to mark that out with a yellow uh, yellow color over here. Now, if I know that I'm going to make a knight's move, a knight moves, say, two rows up and one column uh, to the right-hand side, uh, in that sort of you know, L shape or you know reverse L shape, as the case might be. So if I know that I'm moving a certain number of columns up, and I know that I'm moving a certain number of rows to the right, then my corresponding value might be equals... Um, you know, offset B7, which is my starting value, but then I'm going to move it uh, this many rows uh, and that many columns. Now I've realized I've actually just mucked that up. This is the uh, this is the other way around. We're moving minus two rows and moving one column. So let's try that again. Offset B7, moving two rows up and one column to the right, and you'll see that gives me the corresponding value of 35 which is my correct answer. Uh, similarly, if I wanted to move, say, two columns to the right and one row up, I could put in a two here and a minus one, and that would give me the corresponding uh, knight's move in this direction instead. So the offset function, one more text just to uh, reiterate what that function was. The offset function is a really cool tool that you can use to uh, move around references when you've got these sorts of uh, adjustments that you need to make. All right, so that's those are the sorts of functions that we run into for data retrieval. Um, now we're going to look at some of the other functions that commonly get used uh, relating to data manipulation. Because frequently we're given data, uh, we're given information from our uh, from the course designers, uh, from the um, from the problem uh, from the question designers. Sorry, um, we're given information in a really weird manner. In the case of the slot machine, these are just values. These are the the symbols that we need to look up, and that's that's pretty straightforward. You know, we we get input a symbol and we can look up a symbol. Very nice. But say, for example, that chess example we had here, each arrow pointing in one of eight different directions is a symbol. Um, and that is concatenated with a number. Uh, the number being, how is this, uh, this item going to get moved in uh, different directions? So say, uh, in this, this cell over here, this is a bishop's move. Uh, it starts off in A6. It then moves five steps down and to the right. It moves two steps up and to the right, one step down and to the left, two steps up and to the left, and so on. So, you know, these, these moves that they give us are this combination of a symbol and a number. And what we need to do is essentially split them out and try and find some way of passing that information. So this is where our string manipulation comes in really handy. Um, we can use tools like left, mid, and right to try and work out how do we split these things. Uh, so if I wanted to pick out the, uh, the numeric value of all of these cells, for example, I could say left, uh, left of this cell, give me the first cell, or the first character, and that would tell me I'm picking out the two value. Um, if I copy this down, copy this to the right, I'll continually get all of these values accordingly. Now, it's worth noting that these are text values, and I've realized I've left off one key string manipulation item here, uh, which is the value function. When you're doing string manipulation, what you're generally going to get is a string or a text output. Um, we don't want this to be a text output. We want this to be a numeric output, uh, so we might put a value function around that. Copy that to the right. 
Uh, we can see we're getting an error here, so maybe we need an if error to trap that, um, just as a zero value to say we're not moving in that case. Oops, copy to the right. There we go. So you can see what we're doing here. We're, we're, we're trying to split out the number out of all of these. Now, here's the tricky thing. I would need to copy this down and then copy this to the right. And sometimes I might have more cells and sometimes I might have less cells. Let's try that dynamic array thing. Instead of saying point to B2, let's point to a range of cells which encompasses all of the different moves that might exist. And if I do that, what you'll see is that it gives me an output that solves uh, the, the left, uh, that left number, taking the value of them, removing the errors and uh, making them zero if, if we don't have a value in the cell. It's performing this on all of those cells simultaneously. Now, I've only copied, what is this, 14 different items here. There were, if I remember correctly, 80 different uh, starting positions uh, in this particular question, 60 or 80, something like that. And so rather than copying it down 80 rows and copying it across um, all the time, what I can do instead is just point to the entire range to give me the corresponding values. And that, again, saves so much time. This is the value of using dynamic arrays. Now, similarly, I can use uh, something like the write command. Um, so let's point to all of these cells again. Let's take the rightmost value, um, and that will give me the corresponding arrows, up and down, diagonals, and so forth. So here, I've, I've manipulated that, that text input that I've been given to go from, say, 5 diagonal to a value of 5 and a separate value of a diagonal. Okay. Now, how is this useful? Why, why might I try and do this manipulation? Well, 5 tells me how many steps I need to move. Um, the arrows tell me how many steps in a particular direction I need to move. And so if I have this table over here, maybe I might have a thing that says, well, how many rows are we going to move in our chess piece? And how many columns are we going to move our chess piece? So you know, if we have a down arrow, then we're going to move down one row and no columns. If we're moving up, we're moving minus one row and no columns. If we're moving to the left, it's no rows and minus one column. Uh, to the right is positive one column and so forth. We can populate this little table, right? Um, I can say we're moving one row down, minus one column if it's down and down to the left, uh, up to the right is minus one plus one, uh, back into back and up is minus one and minus one, uh, down and right is one and one. And so suddenly you can start to see how I'm putting all of this together. Uh, I've got a series of you know, steps. I'm breaking them down into how many steps and what direction is the step. Once I know what direction a step is, I can look up to see well how many, how many, uh, you know, how many rows and columns am I moving for each of these steps. So, for example, um, if I were to take this to the next logical step, haha, um, I might say how many rows am I moving. Well, let's look up using that xlookup function, uh, let's look up, whoopsie, let's try that again, equals xlookup, we're going to find not just this value, um, but we're going to find all the values. We're going to look in, let's try again, moving too quickly and not hitting commas, uh, let's, we're going to look in this set of values uh, to find the arrow movements, <clears throat> and we're going to find the corresponding row movements. Now, I can see I'm getting NAs here where there is no arrow to look up. So I better put in something that says, uh, if it's not found, then just give me a value of zero. Excellent. So here I can see these are the corresponding row movements that, uh, that work for each of these uh, arrow movements. So this diagonal arrow down and to the right, followed by up and to the left. Down and to the right is plus one row. Up and to the left is minus one row. We can see how that's flown through. Okay, we could do a similar thing for columns. Again, xlookup, we're looking up 
up all of those values. We're looking it up in this list and we're looking up the corresponding column values. And if we don't find anything, it'll be a zero. Hooray, okay, there we've got our column movements. Brilliant. So I've got the row movements for each diagonal. I've got the column movements for each, uh, or, sorry, each arrow, um, column movements for each arrow. And then what I could do is then combine them with the actual number of steps. So, um, row steps. How many row steps are there? Well, it's going to be uh, that number of rows multiplied by, hey, look, all of these steps that I have here. And again, because I'm using dynamic arrays, I can just take that times that, and it tells me all of these things uh, all at once. Um, if I look at this first example, I'm moving down two rows, down one row, one row, one row, one row. And I can see that's down two rows, one row, one row, one row, one row. Because it's taking the arrows, which move constantly down, and it's cross-multiplying all of that against uh, the number of steps that are being taken. So this has essentially given me the, the total number of row steps that are being made uh, as a result of all of those moves. Um, and similarly, I can do something for the column steps as well. Um, so equals uh, the columns multiplied by the um, number of steps. And so these are all of my column steps. So this is a really cool tool for being able to uh, you know, very quickly uh, generate my generate my results. I'm, I'm using dynamic arrays uh, to quickly tell me how many column movements do I have uh, based on the, the arrows that we're moving and the number of steps that each thing is being moved. So a bit of text manipulation to get my uh, number of steps and then the arrows, my lookup functions to find how many steps each arrow represents, and then my dynamic arrays make it really easy to combine all that information together. Now, at this point, you would then probably say, okay, well, that's pretty straightforward. Now I'm just going to do a basic sum. Uh, I don't need to worry too much about this, but there's my total number of row movements, and here's my total number of column movements and just sum up all the results for each of these steps. Now that's that's one thing you could do, definitely. If you wanted to sort of be a little bit more fancy and, and really get into the dynamic arrays, uh, maybe what we could do instead <clears throat> is do something like a uh, by row, um, by row pointing to all of these cells, we're going to do a lambda that takes a and sums up a where essentially it's going to go into each row it's going to add up the results and spill that out over uh, my uh, my column instead so it's essentially taking that two-dimensional array and summing up all of the rows to give me that result um, if I just do a quick uh, quick look over here adding up this row gives me a sum of minus four that's giving me this minus four over here you can repeat that just oops copy and paste that down into these column steps as well. Copy, paste, that gives me more or less the correct answers as well. There you go. So again, having that knowledge of dynamic arrays and knowing, I guess, how you want to perform that next step. Um, if Not saying that everyone needs to know by row and lambdas and so on, uh, but certainly if you do, that saves you time. Uh, it means that you don't need to copy paste down and sort of work your way through these examples. Okay. <clears throat> so tools like left, mid, right are really useful for this um, <clears throat> value. Now, len is an interesting one. And len comes up not so much in the chess examples, uh, but more so in the card based examples. Have a look at these cards. Um, if I were to take something, uh, something in this first column, and I say, okay, well, give me the first, uh, first character. Uh, whoops, there's my text, and give me the first character. Ace, queen, four, nine, five, five. All of that looks pretty reasonable until I hit the number ten, and I can see that's not actually giving me the correct result. 
Um, actually, if I then spill this out to column A as well, um, I'll say that there are a series of tens that I'm, I'm missing as a result. And so I need to modify this function in a way that checks to see um, how many characters are there in here. So if I were to go equals length, um, equals len of one of these things, I'll see that we have two characters here. Um, but when I've got a 10, I've got three characters. And so maybe what I can do instead is set up some sort of rule that says um, if the length of a1 to e11 equals 2, then take left 1. Otherwise, take left 2. And that should give me the 10s in that particular instance. And when I scroll down, I can see now all of these tens are now appearing very nicely. Now, if I'm trying to get the suits of these cards, I can still just use write. Um, that's not going to be interrupted by the fact that there's uh, you know, uh, two characters in front or one character in front. I'm still going to be able to pull out the suit um, by taking the rightmost character. So it's only the, the numeric value in front or the, the, the card value in front that I'm going to need to adjust accordingly. Now, there is another tricky element to these card play type things, because often what you'll find is that you get uh, numbers 8, 9, 10, and then jack, queen, king, ace. Um, and so what you'll see, um, let me just uh, write, or well, center align all of these, uh, and maybe these have different values, right? Now, if I were to try and look up these values uh, from that list, let's let's use a lookup uh, equals x lookup and try and find all of these values. We'll try and find them uh, in this list and give me the corresponding results over here and give me a zero if they don't exist. Yep. So if we we find something that doesn't exist, like the fours, for example, then we're going to get nothing. Now this seems to work. But it doesn't. Um, and the reason it doesn't is it falls over, say, for example, when this 9 is being looked up. You can see here that the 9 uh, has a value of 20. But when I'm using the XLOOKUP, it's coming through with a value of 0. This is one of those classic issues where um, the text string has been pulled out and it's coming through as a text value, but the value that I'm looking up is actually numeric. Uh, which is a bit sneaky. So what we would need to do is convert this to a text value. Now, a couple of different ways we could do this. We could use something like the text function uh, to just take that and uh, put it in like a general format. Um, and you know that would that would convert it to text. I could I could then x look up that result and that'll be fine. Uh, however, uh, there is value in just skipping the function-based approach and doing things manually sometimes because they're fast. And so if I know I've only got to modify these three things rather than try and look up a formula to get this to work, um, often what I might simply do is just go in, put an inverted comma in front, inverted comma, um, inverted comma, and then now those functions start to work. So that can be a much cleaner way of getting the answer right. Um, this works really well when you've got a very small number of tasks that you need to do, but you know you only ever need to do them once and you're not gonna need to revisit them. Um, so it's often a way that you can manipulate things, um, manipulate the data accordingly. Um, in practice though, what I probably wouldn't do is do it in these cells. I'd probably make a copy uh, and paste them somewhere else and then put in the uh, uh, adjustments because that way I'm not tampering with the original data. So it's always a good idea to keep the original data in as clean and pristine uh, a position as possible. Okay. Um, yeah, there are a couple of other array manipulation type tools um, that I want to go that I can go through. We talked about sequence before, uh, but unique really is the key one that I want to highlight here, where I've got a you know big long set of dice over here. Um, and I might want to say, what are the actual values that I have? Because I want to be able to generate a sort of a, a list that says one, two, three, four, five, six, but I can't actually, like, I don't actually know what this Unicode value is, 
um, you know, I could, I could go through and find them individually one at a time and copy and paste them in place, but you know, that's going to take a really long time to generate. So what I might do instead is do something like um, a, uh, maybe a two call where I want to take this whole range and turn it into one giant column. And then I'm going to take the unique of that column to give me my six values. If I want to be really fancy, maybe I can sort that. Um, I don't know if it sorts in Unicode. Yes, it does. One, two, three, four, five, six. And now these are my values with six values, right? Um, if I thought that maybe they were going to have dice that didn't have just six dots on them, what I could do is do something like count count A specifically, because this is non-numeric, uh, count A of the items that come out of this list, because that way, if there happen to be, uh, say, only five dice, or if there are ten dice, then the count numbers would expand and contract accordingly. So that's where using functions like, say, to col, unique, sort, and then that count A to you know, aggregate and give me the results for. Um, this is how you can use those functions in conjunction with each other. Mm -hmm. All right, we've been talking a lot about these different examples. We were talk talking about the functions uh, that you might need uh, to get, get things to work. Um, I'll do a really, really simple example of a data table, I guess now. Um, one, the approach that we've taken here is to use currently um, a, I guess, a, a, a dynamic array type approach, right? Um, if instead of a dynamic array, um, or instead of trying to solve this for all of these problems at once, I tried to solve it for one problem uh, at a time instead. So let's just look at only uh, row two. So because they're all dynamic arrays, this has now shifted uh, to one row. This is one row. All of these which feature uh, those results are all shifting to one row as well. Fair enough. So my row steps here, I've got six row steps and zero column steps. So uh, say scenario uh, one, I have row steps of six and column steps of zero. Now the question is, how do I make this work for all of the other scenarios as well? Well, I've got this function that's pointing to B2 to K2, right? Um, what I might actually say is, well, don't just point to B2 to K2. I actually want to point to, uh, I guess, a, a sort of an applied uh, scenario step. So I'm going to insert a couple of rows here. Uh, I'm going to copy that B2 to K2 down uh, down to the bottom, and I'm going to just change my cell references to point to this new uh, this new row that I've created. Okay, so this is now sort of the applied step of step number one. Uh, I might say that this is indeed step number one, uh, the first the first option. Um, instead of hard coding this, I might say, well, this is equal to index. Let's point to all of these cells that I have in this list and grab the first item, anchoring that down so I can then copy it to the right. Now, these are giving me zeros outside, which is not the end of the world. I'm happy that doesn't break anything, so that's okay. Now, the advantage of doing it like this is that I can now change this uh, scenario. I'm gonna highlight this cell in yellow. As this is my assumption cell. If I make this two, it's going to feed in all the values from row two. If I highlight 14, this is going to feed in all the values from row 14 and give me the corresponding answer. Um, you know, six rows and zero columns in this case. So that scenario is not just scenario one, this is actually scenario number 14. Now, suppose that I want to run this, uh, run these calculations for all 14 scenarios. Well, I can create a list of those 14 scenarios. Let's create a sequence of 14 numbers. Now, in general, when you're using a data table, you don't want to use functions in the lookup values. So I'm going to hard code these by pasting values, just so I've got some fixed numbers, one to 14. Now, if I select the one to 14 on the left-hand side, and I select the outputs, the row and the column numbers on the right-hand side, 
What I can then do is go to data, go to what if analysis, because that's where you can find the data table. The data table is how we run these scenarios. Um, and I want to say the row input cell, that top row, do we want to put those numbers anywhere? No, we don't. Um, the first column though, do we want to put these numbers somewhere? Well, that one to 14, we want to put those numbers into the yellow cell. Um, we want that to change um, from one, show us what the result is, put it, make it two, show us what the result is, and so on until we get to 14, and then it'll show us what the result is. So when I hit OK and scroll back down, well, nothing happens right now. And that's probably because if I go to formulas and check my calculation options, you'll see it's set to automatic except for data tables. Because data tables are calculating scenarios, they're causing your entire file to recalculate whenever it does anything. So if I were to switch it to automatic instead, say, it's then going to try to calculate all of these results. I can see this has been hard coded, so I'm going to relink this instead to the row steps and relink the column, the column steps. And now I can see I have all of the different answers for the 14 different scenarios based on uh, the results of this data table. Now, in the Modeling Excel World Championship, often you'll be given uh, a single sort of sample question where you get told, this is the sample, and if you get this right, you should be able to answer all the rest of the questions. And so you might have one sample that you're, that you're going to test. Uh, that might be the very first item in your, in your list of scenarios. At which point, once you know that works, and you've built all your calculations to get it to work, then you can feed the rest of that into a data table to get all of your answers for each calc. Uh, that's a really efficient way of solving the problems. All right, running out of time. So why don't we jump back into uh, PowerPoint quickly to see, well, those are the skills that we need. And hopefully that's given you an idea as to how to use those skills uh, to solve a lot of these um, Microsoft Excel World Championship questions. But how do you actually perform under pressure? Well, first of all, use best practice. Don't rush. Don't change the way you work just because you're, you're time constrained. Um, if you're the sort of person who uses best practice, you highlight inputs, you use tables, you use borders, you use colors and so forth, keep doing that. Because when you're looking around your spreadsheet, you're going to be instinctively looking for those formatting tools to try and work out what different uh, calculations are doing. The second point is to quickly decide whether to use one row of your calculations or use a calculation block. Um, one row is, to, to do everything in one row, uh, I'll show you back to, back to an example of this. Imagine if I had all of the row, um, well, the num numeric values here, and all of the movements uh, going across, and then I had the row steps on the right, and the column steps on the right, and everything was all in one row. That would mean that I could simply just copy it down the page once, and that would give me the answer to everything. Alternatively, what I've done here, I've kind of built these in, in a block. I've got a whole bunch of calc steps where I'm doing step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, step six. Um, and as a result, I need a data table to give me the answer instead. So whichever way you go about it, it they're both reasonably effective. I think it's probably a little bit faster if you can do it in a single row, but it's also a little bit harder as well uh, because you've got to keep scrolling back and forth to see what the calculation is doing. Um, so that's a call that you'll need to make to try and work out which is the more efficient way of working through it. In these problems, there are often bonus questions. Uh, bonus questions are worth extra points, so don't lose those points. Uh, as a commentator, I've been screaming at the screen when I've been watching people um, not score bonus points, especially when they end up losing as a result of not scoring those bonus points. Uh, we've seen it happen so many times in the past, and so if you're going to be competing in this thing, then you know try and get all the points that you can. Don't leave anything on the table. When you're answering questions, try and answer using logic that can solve the next question as well. So don't just try and solve things for you know this this tiny little um, box. Um, the best modelers out there will think ahead and try and work out 
um, you know, can they build a solution that is not just solving the problem that they're looking at right now, but also thinking ahead and thinking, well, what else do I need to solve in the future? Um, can I can I account for those sorts of problems as well, um, so that you don't need to reinvent the wheel when you get to the second uh, the next question? And finally, uh, the 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 funny approach at the very end in the last couple of minutes, everybody uses round between uh, to try and eke out a few additional points. Um, Ran between, if you've never seen it, um, ran between allows you to generate numbers between, say, a value uh, of, say, 1 and 10. Um, and if I were to then copy this down a whole range of cells, then